esteem because economic factors were the most important things to Americans and they wanted to learn how to get ahead. And New, New Thought was his philosophy that told you how to do it with your mind. And so he used that understanding to tell us about the sutras. When he, when he translated the sutras and commentated on it and published this book called Raja Yoga that became a bestseller, he did it in New Thought, That's, that kind of thinking is called New Thought, in New Thought terms. And it was this huge hit. It spoke to Americans. It spoke to them where, where they're at. And so they were introduced to yoga in this very efficient way. And yoga started to become popular. Um, and now we get a little bit to the story of women. His early followers and champions were women, wealthy women, who gave him platforms to speak, who gave him places to stay, who supported him with money. His early and powerful fo followers, like Sister Nivedada, followed him to India, and spent, she spent the rest of her life in India, and actually even um, uh, was a champion for Indian independence and worked tirelessly for the pride of Indians. Um, this is kind of a cool picture. It's one of the first yoga retreats. <laughs> up in Sonoma County, because he came, he left uh, America in 1897, and he came back in 1899, or did he leave in 1896? Somewhere around there, he came back in 1899, and when he came back the second time, he came to the West Coast. He spent time in San Francisco and Los Angeles, started centers here, centers eventually started here, and um, spoke in Oakland, across the Bay, and he... He had these women followers here, and he took them up to Marin and had a little yoga retreat. As you see, the Lululemon fashion is man. <laughs> Go to the next slide. He brought, I, you had that picture of Abhidananda. He brought Abhidananda over in 1896, and even though Vivekananda was a physical culturalist, even though he believed in the robustness of the body, and he was very much... Uh, a, a masculine character. He really believed in manhood. He did not teach Hatha Yoga. He didn't believe in Hatha Yoga. He had a Hatha Yoga guru by the name of Pap Haribaba who he worked with for about eight months after Ramakrishna died. And so he knew Hatha Yoga. He could have taught it, but he didn't feel like it was a legitimate system. And his opinion was consistent with the opinion of the age. We think Hatha Yoga is really, really cool. We think it's something really, really pure that leads to enlightenment. But in that day, it was something that was looked down upon. People didn't have a high view of it because that guy you saw over in the corner who was wearing that G-strap, you said, what was the way that you said? That's just not right. Everybody was saying that about the hot yogis because they were these crazy guys in the streets doing these weird contortions. And why would you think that contortion was a way to develop your body? You know, we, for now, now it's a developed system and we understand how it works, but in those days it was a complete mystery. And it wasn't a very appealing mystery. It was kind of like, guys are kind of funny. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna do what they're doing. We're gonna learn the story of how it became popular. But at this point it wasn't popular. But it had it gained ground very quickly when Abhidananda started teaching it. He taught it from a very pure perspective. He was also a follower of, the, of Rama Ramakrishna. He was his brother monk. He brought him over he started teaching it in the East Coast. Some of Vivekananda's followers complained because they didn't like Hatha Yoga. But, nonetheless, it caught on very quickly in a fad. Believe it or not, more than a hundred years ago, there was a fad of Hatha Yoga in New York City. So we have this article from New York City which gives us evidence of it. And it was written by this guy, Swami Kripa, Kripananda, who was... Um, anointed by Swami Vivekananda. And when you read this article, it's very much like the way we think of yoga now. It's not that different. Can anybody, can anybody read what the... Can you want to read what the paper... You're closer to it. You want to read it, Monica, what it says? The newspaper says? The, the article? Or the yeah, just, just read the headlines. What, what, okay. see that if, you want to be a yo if you want to be a yogi and have heavenly dreams, study these postures. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, the bomb of the Orient. Bliss inspiring yoga. What does Swami says of it? New York's fashionables now attain perfect happiness by becoming amateur contortionists. <laughs> So that's how they saw it. You know, they saw it as contortion. Right? It's like contortion was somehow a way to the divine. 
And people made space for this mystery. I mean, they were willing to believe it. Some people were, some people who were open-minded. But it was always, it was, and the way it had to be presented, like in a newspaper article, was kind of tongue-in-cheek. They kind of half took it seriously, and they have to, you know, we still see this attitude, though yoga has gained a lot of ground. It's taken very seriously now. But still there's a lot of people who don't take it seriously. I think it's just kind of mystic, mystical hubbub. You know? I was just in Kentucky last week. They thought it was pretty silly. Yeah, right. I mean, here in the West Coast, it's just like woven in the fabric of our yeah. lives. And you see it in advertising all over the world now. But still, a lot of people just think, I mean, especially people who are deeply in another religious tradition, they think, they even think it's evil. Yeah. Go to the next slide. But it's kind of cool. You see these cool drawings of it. So I just want to point to another kind of influence at the time. This guy, Francis Deslarte developed a system that was a post system, that was a crazy popular fad at the time that Vivekananda was here in America.